Hello, uh, this is Portrait of a Physicist. My name is Ivan Schuler. I'm from the Physics Department at the University of California, San Diego. My first guest in Portrait of a Physicist is Professor Harry Sewell. Professor Sewell is a cook, is a bon vivant, and is also a physicist. Hello, Harry. So, Harry, uh, we're trying to establish a historical record of the Physics Department at the University of California. And I would like to ask you a few questions, and maybe we can discuss a little bit Feel free to interject anything that you find interesting. So let me ask you the first question is, how did you become a physicist and why you became a physicist? Well, um, as, a, as a kid, I went to a gymnasium in Germany. And that gymnasium emphasized was a so-called real gymnasium, which emphasized foreign languages and uh, the humanities but also had some mathematics. Uh, and uh, the first time I became interested in something quantitative was when the, the, this particular math teacher asked people, what would happen if you took a polygon and made more and more sides on it? What would it eventually become? And uh, the kids just uh, sat there and didn't react. But I did react. I said, well, eventually it will become a circle. And that achieved considerable praise from this math teacher for, for reasons that I did not understand at the time. But it did send me thinking, but not, while I was still in high school, this never really made me seriously think about either mathematics or the natural sciences. So, so was there anything else in your life that you would have wanted to be? Like you always say that you would like to be an exotic dancer. <laughs> uh, well, um, let's see. No, I guess, I guess not, there wasn't, because gradually I developed, uh, I, I developed an interest in science Partly as a result of the war, because I... You mean the Second World War? The Second World War, yes. Yes. Not the Vietnam War. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Second World War. And um, that sort of set me on that path. Also, I, uh, when I first started to study at the University of Wales, uh, there was a philosopher teacher who tried to persuade me to go into philosophy, because apparently my essays were exceptionally good. And uh, he, he also sometimes praised my sense of humor, but I realized early in life that I, my career was in, in, as a comedian, I wouldn't really succeed, so I went into physics. So would you have liked to be a comedian? Well, no, but I might have if that philosophy professor had been more insistent, maybe I would have gone into the arts, but I doubt it. I think I would have gone into the So, arts. and how did you come to UCSD? What, what's... Uh... Oh, to UC, UCSD, that was interesting. Um, first there was Roger Ravel, before anything, and he somehow got hold of Keith Bruckner, and Keith Bruckner knew that Bell Labs at that time was a very active institution and that might provide good fertile grounds for starting a physics department here. And uh, so he came to Bell Labs and of course the first guy he contacted was uh, Ben Matthias, who was always uh, uh, very visible even at that time, and uh, he, the first thing he did was really recruit Ben Batias. And then he realized that there were other people there, like George Fayer, uh, also myself, and so on. And so he expanded his recruiting activities to the rest of us. And uh, that's the way I 
physics. So how was how was UCSD uh, physics at the time? Was it uh, were there lots oh, of parties? Were there a lot oh, of yes. physics? Was it a lot uh, of excitement? As as you undoubtedly know, it really started as an uh, institution of oceanography, but there were already a co at least a couple of physicists associated with it. One of them, a very famous one, Carl Eckhart, and the other was Leonard Lieberman. Uh, and so they, they were interested in physics and certainly took an immediate interest in the formation of a whole physics department. So, and then also one of the early recruits was Walter Cohn. In fact, who, he came who? here a few months before myself. Who eventually got the Nobel Prize. Well, yes, and he eventually got the Nobel Prize. And then, not too long afterwards, uh, Keith succeeded in recruiting uh, the mayors, and as you know, Maria Mayor got the Nobel Prize, and also he got chemists, he got uh, Harold Urey from Chicago, and they got... Uh, that was Bruckner? That was Bruckner? Bruckner got, got good? That was essentially Bruckner. Now Bruckner, of course, got assisted by the people he recruited. Uh, and he had a very interesting technique. Uh, he promised Mr. A that Mr. B was coming, and Mr. B that Mr. C was coming, and Mr. C that Mr. A was coming, and as a result, they all came. <laughs> they were self consistent. <laughs> self consistent. Self consistent hiring. I heard also a story that he would take you to, a, to some kind of a, a barren land in somewhere in La Jolla in the mountain, and then he would show it to you and say to you that you could. Uh, by that land yes, to build yourself a he house. Was a, he was a very good PR man at the time. He showed people where they could live, how they would have views of the ocean and the beach, and uh, they could go serving. But I think a big incentive, uh, and perhaps I should be ashamed to say, was that he said there won't be any undergraduates for at least four more years. It would all be a graduate institution to begin with. And you know, when you're just at that age, four to five years seems like, almost like infinity. Right. <laughs> that was, a, I'm ashamed to say. So we I, talked about these famous people like uh, yeah. Cohn and uh, Bruckner yeah. and uh, Maria Meyer. Are there anybody in the physics department, like during your time that you were here, that actually surprised you, that kind of became a surprise that were, they accomplished no, big things without you expecting it. Somehow. Yeah, my, my, perhaps my biggest surprise was George Fair. He was already famous for his work on nuclear and electron resonance, but what really surprised me is that he took off six months, no, six months or a year and went to MIT or Harvard to study biology sufficiently so that when he came back here, he would really start some serious experimental work on the physics aspect of biology, and he became a great expert in photosynthesis. And in fact, there was a considerable uh, question about whether he should not at least have participated in the Nobel Prize that was finally entirely given to a German bio. By biologist. But uh, he said, well, it doesn't matter. What matters is the journey, not the destination. Oh, that's uh, very profound. But yes. I don't know, I have suspect he might have liked the destination. <laughs> yes, also. also. So, uh, uh, can you mention any, any interesting scientific developments during your life that you least foresee and they sort of most affected your life? Yes, I remember. One of them was a relatively recent one, the, the development of certain, uh, certain low-frequency aspects of metamaterials. Uh, that was, even though they were predicted in the 1950s or somebody by a Russian physicist, nobody ever thought that this was of any great interest, and it turned out that in certain frequency ranges you could make 
you could make objects invisible and so on. And there is always the hope that one day this can be extended over enormously broad bands. And so far nobody has discovered a, a, a proof that this would not be possible. So it may actually happen, and I think potentially that is a really profound development. This was, you're talking about uh, uh, Shelley Schultz yes. and David Smith and all this stuff. Shelley Schultz, who was an early recruit in this department, really developed his lab to such an extent that his students were able to verify this effect relatively, relatively quickly. So, so when I was at UCLA, uh, I used to talk to Ted Holstein a lot. Mm -hmm. And Ted Holstein at that moment told me in the uh, mid-70s, he told me you should work on oxides mm -hmm. because oxide metal insulator transition is not well understood. And this stuck in my mind and, you know, 25 years later I started working on this thing. Do you know of any problem like that, like an old problem that you've been thinking of and you wish somebody would work on and... Uh, uh, um, let's see. Well, I don't want to put you in the spot, but... Uh, well, uh, some particular subject... Like a problem that, you know, you think it would be nice to solve it, but, uh, you know, it, it well, isn't... Yes, there are always theoretical problems around that would be nice to solve, whether they had impact on, on society or not. One of them, of course, was quantum mechanics in general, which, of course, uh, everybody would like to understand and nobody does. And the other relatively minor thing was the so-called condor effect, which has very little application, but which was the first time that uh, that ordinary common garden perturbation theory wouldn't deliver the, go the good. But that was solved, I mean, the condor effect more or less was solved, no? Well, that was, it is never, yes, that has been solved in the sense of, uh, totally solved only at, at the absolute zero of temperature, first of all. And it's not a solution that you can sort of look at and say, oh yes, how simple. It's complicated. Yeah. So, Harry, you are known for uh, your famous sayings, and as you all know, mm -hmm. I've been compiling your sayings, and I have a list of sayings of yours. Uh, but. Uh, I just, uh, um, uh, uh, one of them actually reminded me of something that you were doing and that we never touched on, which is your administrative work at UCSD. So you were chairman of the department and you said, one of your sayings, you said that as a chairman, I learned to exchange friction for work. You remember <laughs> this? Yes. Okay, so can you tell me uh, how was it like to be a chairman with all these famous people and trying to get all these famous people to, to well, work? I, I must say, there was an insulating layer between me and both faculty and students in the form of the secretary, of my secretary of the time, Joyce Sessa. She uh, really insulated me from the most uh, atrocious <laughs> demands and problems of both students and faculty. And, uh, in fact, maybe I will, if she comes to my festival, maybe I will acknowledge her separately. But uh, that really helped a great deal. Now, whether it was a matter of converting friction into work, I'm not absolutely. It was certainly converting friction into the work for John Sessa. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this is great. So to, to finish off, Harry, I want to ask you, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but, uh, but I just would like to ask you, is, is there any wisdom that you can offer to the young generation that over, you know, I know this is a kind of a you know, difficult question, but is there mm -hmm. anything that you can sort of wisdom offer? Wisdom the professional? Yeah, on the professional side, yeah, I guess. Well, no, 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 also, please, could you go ahead. <laughs> Tell us about the uh, personal side. Why not? Tell us about the girls in the beach or about uh, whatever. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, don't, don't take things too damn seriously. That would be my advice. Because all it does, it 
causes high blood pressure. And you can't really, you can't really change the world very profoundly. You better learn to live with it. And read the book by Voltaire, where the chief character keeps on saying, oh, this is fine, in this best of all possible words. You're talking about Candide? Yes, Candide. Which actually you got me to read uh, myself, and so that was actually a very yes. positive influence That's on me. Right. So if you, if you try to see the humorous aspects of even serious situations, if there are any humorous aspects, it, it will help you to keep your spirits up, let's put it that way. Well, so this is my first interview in the portrait of a physicist. My guest was uh, Professor Harry Sewell. As you see, a very interesting person with whom we could have spent quite a bit of time, but the time has come. Thank you, Harry, and I hope uh, we'll do this interview again in 20 years. Oh, thank well, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I hope you will be the one to interview. Well, I hope I'll, I'll be here, yes. <laughs> <laughs> if not, we'll find somebody younger to interview you. <laughs> okay, right. but thank you. Oh, <laughs>